Hello, everyone, and welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, Dr. Karen Wyatt, and this is episode number 286. Today, in a few moments, I'll be sharing with you an interview I did with Tenzin Kiyosaki, who is a former Buddhist nun who became a hospice chaplain, and she's going to share some of her wisdom. And let me tell you, this would be a great episode to grab a cup of tea or a coffee, sit back in a comfortable chair, and just listen and and take this in. Tenzin and I have such a beautiful, gentle, compassionate conversation together, and you can just let it wash over you and really open your heart as you're listening. Tenzin is amazing. You will feel her calmness and her compassion in her voice as you listen to her. So let this episode be a soothing balm for you when you have a chance to listen to it, and if possible, relax while you're listening and really take it all in. Before I start to play that episode, though, I have one announcement and then a little story for you. So the announcement is there is the Laughter Yoga webinar coming up on February 17th, and it's online on Zoom with Janet Carroll, RN, who was my guest last week, and we talked all about laughter yoga. But in this webinar, she's going to teach us specific exercises we can do for ourselves and also teach to other people that we're working with in laughter yoga. So a one hour free webinar just for fun. If you register for it, you'll get the link for a replay. Even if you're listening to this and the webinar has come and gone, you can still go to the link and register and you'll be able to watch the replay down the road for a long time down the road so you can access it later. All you have to do is go to the show notes for this episode at eolupodcast.com. Look for episode number 286 and down near the bottom, scroll down and you'll find links mentioned in this episode and there will be a link there to register for the laughter yoga webinar. So I hope you'll do that and enjoy some laughter right now at a time when we all really need it. And so this brief story I wanted to share with you took place many years ago during my own grief journey over my dad's suicide death. And it was it was several years into my my very long grief process. And at that point, I had I'd been able to get myself out of the black hole of grief that I'd really been consumed by in the first few years. But I was living in what I now think of as a grayscale. Uh, everything in my life was gray. And if you ever have ever printed anything with gray scale on your printer, you know, there are varying shades of gray, lighter gray and darker gray. But I'd been living in this state of seeing only gray around me for a long time. And I had actually come to accept the gray as normal in many ways. To me, it just seemed like that's what life is. Everything looks slightly gray. And so it was as if I was seeing through gray chiffon or something and everything around me was tinted gray by this filter that I was looking through. And again, as I said, I I had even forgotten that life could be any different than that, or that things in my world could look different than they did because I'd been looking through that gray filter for such a long time. I really had no idea that things could be different than they were. So one day I was driving to pick my son up. He'd been playing at a friend's house and I was I was just driving to pick him up. And I stopped at a stop sign at an intersection and I was driving right next to this adorable park that we went to all the time to, for, to play in and have picnics. It had a little duck pond in the middle and lots of trees and flowers around. I was I was stopped next to that park. So at a stop sign. And Uh, across from me, opposite me, was a car coming toward me in my direction, also stopped at at that stop sign. 
And when the traffic was clear, as I pushed down on the accelerator to move forward into the intersection, I happened to glance over at the other car opposite me that that was now passing right next to me. And the woman who was driving that car turned her head and made eye contact with me. And she smiled the most beautiful, amazing genuine and generous smile uh, I, I could ever imagine. Just a huge, spontaneous smile that was so pure. It, it wasn't a smile of obligation. Oh, I guess I'm supposed to smile now. Uh, it didn't have any agenda attached to it. She simply looked me in the eye and smiled at me. In that very instant, It was as if someone turned the color switch on in my life. It's like in the movie, The Wizard of Oz, you know, it begins in black and white or grayscale, actually, and then suddenly switches into technicolor. It was an amazing moment for me when suddenly, because of this woman's smile, something shifted for me. I, I saw the vivid blue of the hood of my car. I noticed the green pine trees in the park next to me and the grass and the yellow and red flowers that were growing there. I saw the blue water of the pond and the ducks that were the white ducks that were swimming on the pond. It, it was it was phenomenal. I saw the blue of the sky so intense as if I'd as if I'd never even seen the sky before. And all around me, there were just vivid, beautiful colors. And I remembered, I remembered once again that this is how things used to look to me. This is how it used to be so long ago. And I suddenly became aware of that gray veil that had hung over me for such a long time. And as I said, it was an amazing transformation, instantaneous, that I began to see in Technicolor. And that experience lasted, I think, for a couple of days that I could see the colors all around me. But gradually, the grayness began to descend again. Gradually, I settled back into that place where I could feel the weight of this heavy veil upon me and things turned gray. But I started to learn that I could voluntarily get to a place of being able to see the color again simply by closing my eyes and remembering that experience of seeing that woman a total stranger to me someone I never saw again in my life but seeing her smile by recalling that moment I could bring the color back and sometimes it only lasted for a brief while sometimes it would last longer but over time I became more and more able to shift my own perspective into the world of color whenever I wanted to and and nowadays I would say I live in the technicolor world most of the time, nearly all the time, but there are still days, and this has especially been true for the past year, that when I feel the heavy veil descending upon me, I literally feel the weight of it. And my whole body feels like it sinks down into the earth. The weight is so heavy. And suddenly, I notice that I'm seeing gray wherever I look. And because now I'm so much more tuned in, being in grayscale does not feel normal anymore. I know right away, oh, wait a second, I've allowed this weight to descend upon me. And I do have a little ritual of sometimes asking why is there something that I could learn from this time of being in the gray zone and Do I need to just appreciate it and embrace it while it's here and see what I can learn? Other times I realize I just allowed something I read or heard to get to me and to create fear inside of me. And as soon as I recognize what's happening... And I become conscious of, oh, this this grayness has descended upon me because I've shifted into a place of fear. And I just talk to myself for a moment and gradually I will feel the gray lifting away and the color returning. But that's a practice that I've honed for years and years and years. I've worked hard at that to be at a place where I can get myself out of the gray zone. 
fairly quickly whenever I need to. But the point of this little story is to tell you that you can not underestimate the power of one look, one glance, one gaze, one smile toward another person. You you will never know how much your just your intentionally making eye contact with someone and sending out a feeling of love you will never know what transformation that could possibly bring about for another person so don't ever imagine that you are not making a difference in the world because when you show up wherever you go, whatever you're doing, and you're bringing a loving heart, and you're allowing that loving energy to flow through you, you can change the people around you, you can bring color into their lives, you can bring a feeling of love and safety and peace to them simply by the way you make eye contact and gaze at them in a loving way. I realize right now most of us are wearing masks because of the coronavirus. Someday people will listen to this and say, what? People were wearing masks? <laughs> but So I realize our mouths are covered. And that has taken away one of our major forms of expression and of sharing joy and love and peace with other people. But this is a great time to practice using your eyes and to know that with your eyes and eyebrows and your forehead, you can also convey a a tremendous amount of feeling to other people and you can even practice it and watch how your eyes change when you smile. Watch the light that comes into your eyes and the little crinkle and practice allowing your eyes to be the vessel of the love and compassion that you want to show to other people. It's a great time to use our eyes more than we may have in the past and all the more so important to actually make eye contact with people, to be willing to look at their eyes and and send them for a brief moment a bit of love and compassion and joy through your eyes. Now, I will make one more little disclaimer. I sometimes hear from people who tell me, but there are people around me that don't really deserve my love and I don't want to give them love because it might seem that I condone their behavior. There are bad people in the world. To that, I say that I believe that everyone deserves love, no matter whether we judge them to be a bad person or not, no matter if they've done bad things. It's not up to us to decide that someone else doesn't deserve love. We're simply here to be vessels, to be non-judgmental vessels and share the love and to not overthink it and try to analyze if someone else is worthy of love or not. Honestly, that isn't even really a fair or valid analysis. Remember that we're, we're just here to fill ourselves with love so that we can transmit it to other people and particularly to strangers, people we don't even know, we don't know anything about. And love is not a zero-sum game. There is not a limited amount of love, so we have to withhold it from certain people to make sure we have enough to give to other people. Love is infinite and abundant and overflowing, and the more we share it, the more we have to share, the more other people have to share as well. And you know what? If you actually did share love with someone who had done some bad things, who was in a terrible place, who was living their life in an ugly and hurtful way toward others, you might be the only person in their lives who have ever sent them genuine, compassionate love. You might be the person that showed them something new, that gave them a new inspiration, that lifted the veil of hatred from their eyes and helped them see the beauty and the color of love. So I just want to encourage you to remember that you can make a huge difference. Even if you're driving in your car, you don't have to talk to anyone. You don't have to, you don't, you don't have to have an encounter with anyone other than simply glancing at them with integrity and compassion and love and letting it shine through you. 
who knows how many lives you've already changed and how many lives you can change in the future when you go about your day-to-day activities in that state of love and compassion. So we'll move on now with my interview with Tenzin. And uh, I wanted to tell you this story because here's a chance to fill yourself up with some very gentle love and kindness and compassion that Tenzin shares with us as, as she talks about her work. So stay tuned after this interview. I'll come back with a few takeaways and to say goodbye. So here we go. Today, I'm so happy to welcome my guest, Tenzin Kiyosaki. Tenzin, also known as Barbara Emmy Kiyosaki, has been a certified interfaith hospice chaplain at Torrance Memorial Medical Center in Los Angeles, California, since 2008. In 1985, she was ordained by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and practiced as a Buddhist nun for 27 years. Tenzin is the co-author of the book Rich Brother, Rich Sister with her brother, entrepreneur and author Robert Kiyosaki. Tenzin is also the author of the forthcoming book, The Three Regrets, Inspirational Stories of Love and Forgiveness at Life's End, and we'll be talking a bit about that book today. And if you'd like to learn more about Tenzin's work, you can go to her website, at TenzinKiyosaki.com, and there will be a link for the website in the show notes for this episode. So Tenzin, thank you so much for joining me today. Lovely to be with you, Karen. Well, we've already, we already had a wonderful conversation together a month or so ago over the telephone in preparation for this interview, and I'm so excited to have a chance to talk to you again. And I as well. I was uh, really so pleased to hear about your work and to see your website as well. Yes, I felt like we we had a lot in common and shared a, shared a lot from our our spiritual perspective about patients at the end of life. So I'm I'm really happy to be able to share this conversation with our audience. I was hoping you'd um, start by telling us a little bit more about your own story and how you first got interested in becoming a hospice chaplain and working with dying patients. Oh, thank you. I I think that um, my mother was such an inspiration to me in that she was a nurse uh, through World War II Uh, in Honolulu, and um, all my life growing up, uh, she did things that were more in the area of um, public health nursing, so she would work with immunizations into the villages in Hawaii, and I would often go with her uh, as she would administer immunizations to kids around the island, kids and families in different places in the islands, and then After uh, President Kennedy instituted the Peace Corps, um, the the little town that I lived in became the largest um, in-country training area for uh, Peace Corps volunteers that were in training. So they would come in for three months at a time and, and be sent off to all over Southeast Asia as um, north as Nepal and south into uh, the Borneo and Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand. And it was just so inspiring to hear about these people's work and also, you know, to just see how my mom cared for people in a very um, spontaneous way because it was not a hospital environment. And uh, just so it was about service to others. And so my work as a chaplain really came about, actually, um, I had gone to hear Elizabeth Kubler-Ross speak in 1978 after reading uh, one of her first books. And then uh, she spoke in Pasadena, California. Um, I was just riveted with what she was doing and the importance of helping others. And in 78, this was also after I had come back from my first journey in India and just seeing how people faced end of life and 
kind of dignity they had and uh, incredible acceptance and, and to see how we could integrate that here in the West as well. So I first started uh, volunteering in hospice in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And I was also the um, chaplain at the Air Force Academy, not in hospice, but working with cadets who were on their way to becoming uh, Air Force pilots and in other fields. But uh, uh, all of this work um, just led me into becoming a chaplain when I had to uh, find another another source of income besides being a, a nun and living a, a rather peripatetic life. <laughs> so uh, the chaplaincy um, at Torrance Memorial requested that I continue my training. And so I went through the entire training at uh, UCLA and also Long Beach Memorial Medical Center to uh, establish my certification as a, as a chaplain. So, um, and then every day, every day of work in, in chaplaincy is uh, always fresh and you never really know how it's going to unfail, unfold patient to patient uh, because they're on their own important journeys. And even though I may see a patient for several months, no, I'll go in the, the next time and um, their health or cognitive capacity may have radically changed. And so dealing with the the patients and working with the families is um, actually very, very um, satisfying and, and, and wonderful work. So that's where it continues. Mm. I love, as you're saying, how, how unique each experience is with every patient in hospice. And I remember often thinking in my work, it doesn't matter how much training I have, I will almost always encounter something new that I hadn't dealt with or thought about before in my work. But I actually loved it. I loved being challenged to always be learning, always be a student within this work. And then staying creative and fresh and new as, as I approached each patient. Yes, absolutely. And I was just reading um, in uh, Dr. Ira Biok's book, The Best Care Possible, there's a, there's a section in there where he says he was telling his students, you know, he always imagines the patients well. And I was thinking how he says in the book, you know, it might sound like woo, but <laughs> you get to the place where you really are working with the person rather than be stopped or walled off by their illness, whether it's dementia or whether it's physical incapacity, that there's this part of being able to uh, work heart to heart. And I really encourage that with the families as well, because in hospice, we're not just working with the patient, we're working with the entire family around and the, the caregivers, people around them. And so I often encourage them to speak to the heart of the patient, how they were, how you remember them, how you love them, and to engage in life review so that you can really go to that place of wonderful energy that you share together rather than pull, being pulled down by the illness or the lack of memory or the grief that's there, but to recall and to change, you know, change that energy. Of, remember that time we, we hiked through the Grand Canyon and uh, to just change the ambiance and the memory and the uh, energy of this. So I love that idea of, of um, speaking to the heart of the patients. Mm. Oh, that's so beautiful. And I, I know you mentioned um, that you, you studied Buddhism in India, I believe, um, or in Nepal. Uh, India, a lot. 
um, quite a few years, but I also studied a lot in um, here in Los Angeles and in Colorado. I finished, I completed my master's degrees in Buddhist studies in, in Boulder, Colorado. And, um, but no, uh, practicing as a nun and living in, an, in a Tibetan nunnery in the Himalayas was uh, quite an, a profound education as well. And, um, and, then, and then being with Western monastics was also quite wonderful. And a small group of us started something called the, uh, it was called Western, uh, West, Western Buddhist Gathering. I forget exactly the, the term, but a few of us started because, you know, we were just a few Westerners who would, who would go off to India and live with these, these Tibetan people and study their culture, their language, their monastic vows, etc. But there were other Westerners who were going off to Sri Lanka and Japan and Korea and and um, uh, other other countries, other Buddhist countries. So we started gathering here in the West, which was a fantastic education, you know, because we'd. We'd ask them, well, what did you learn living in the monasteries in Thailand or being a forest monk? How did you survive in the forest? Or to the uh, Chinese um, practitioners who were very disciplined and had had very clean and precise uh, attention to vows. Uh, and so uh, um, we would gather once a year. But the Western Western monastics and learn from each other. And it's just really a, a lovely, lovely time. Mm, so fascinating. And I, I just know I've never traveled in, in the East myself, but uh, after reading the Tibetan book of Living and Dying by Sogyal Rinpoche, I was so touched by uh, what it appeared to be the Eastern mindset around death and embracing death as a normal part of life and contemplating death every day as a way of preparing for it. I realized that we're really missing something here in our Western culture because we we have avoided death and, and really left it out of our culture as if it's something we could somehow escape. It will somehow go away if we don't think about it or talk about it. Yeah, there is that kind of view that people have, that even in hospice, where they feel like if we if we don't talk about it, then it won't come so quickly, or it we can keep it at bay. Whereas it is such a an integral part of us being born, because we were born, we're going to face this. And if we really examine any living thing, whether it's a tree or a person, that it has a limited lifetime, an approximate lifespan, but it's something that we're all going to face. And so how much healthier it'll be rather than being afraid or... Um, superstitious about it, but to be able to prepare ourselves life throughout, throughout our life, lifelong, so that it's something that is much more natural and accepting. Yes, and and this perspective on impermanence, which I think it just it makes life that much more precious to us when we're aware that. It's fleeting and it won't last forever. I, I, I so much want to see our Western society embrace it and particularly Western medicine as well, which I think has done itself and patients a disservice, again, by, by not embracing the idea of impermanence and not, not valuing life in some ways in the right way valuing the possibility of extending life forever instead of valuing life right here, right now, in this present moment. Exactly. But then, you know, when you realize, oh my gosh, say we've got a hundred year lifespan. Now, let me use those hundred years well. 
rather than thinking it just can go on infinitely. And to realize that, you know, in the first 15, 20 years of our life, we're really dependent on our parents or, you know, the, our schools to help shape us. And then we have this wonderful, long midlife period where we have a tremendous independence and capacity to uh, create and live and enjoy uh, good health. And, and then towards the end, when we need help again, when we need uh, greater support because our body starts to decline and our, our mental health or our, our cognitive capacity can also start to decline. And then we're very dependent on others again. So to look at it in the, in the place of, oh my gosh, this is really a precious time. And how do I want to use it? How can I use it well? so that it benefits not only myself, but those loved ones and family around me. And rather than thinking, you know, it's uh, nothing special. Yes. Oh, yes, exactly. That's so the mindset that I feel we, we really need to, to move toward here in our society. And I was thinking that it seems to me that your Buddhist training would be perfect for the work you do as a chaplain in hospice, that that prepares you really well to address these issues of, you know, finding meaning in life and facing the impermanence and dealing with that at the end of life. And um, I know that just from, from your book and also from talking with you that at some point as a hospice chaplain, you decided to return your, vows as a Buddhist nun and become a lay person again. And so I was wondering if you would talk, talk a little bit about that journey and what led you to decide to, uh, to return your vows and go back to being a lay person. Yes, thank you. I found that my vows were sometimes in the way of my interacting with patients that I would like to just go in, introduce myself as a chaplain, as part of the team, and be available to the patient and families. But wearing the monastic vows, having a short haircut, uh, bald almost, and in India I would shave my head, um, that it it was a, a barrier because people didn't recognize the... Uh, uh, my robes or what I was going to lay on them, quote unquote. So it was uh, hard. I would find that I often had to explain myself first rather than just being present there for them. And um, so it, it was a big uh, deciding factor for me. I wanted to be much more available to others. I do have a friend who uh, is a chaplain at a large um, senior living facility that is full full scope. In other words, active li living to to uh, a, a small clinic for end of life. And she said she stopped wearing her reverse collar because that would that would put off people if they weren't of her faith or um, it would become the topic of conversation about, about their, own, their own religious concerns or challenges rather than being present for them with uh, their own spiritual life. Mm. I, I can relate to that in a sense because, you know, in my own profession as a doctor, I stopped wearing a white coat as soon as I finished my training. I had to wear the white coat when I was in the hospital and, and various clinics during my training. But I stopped wearing it right away because I found just having it on. I mean, I, it's something, something about the way that you're dressed conveys a message to people that you're caring for. And 
uh, for me, the white coat implied far too much of, I think, the rigidity <laughs> of Western medicine in a way. And I did not want my patients when I walked in the room to automatically think they knew who I was or what I represented by seeing how I was dressed. So I only wore street clothes and never put on the white coat again in my medical practice. So I can really understand even more so the robes that you were wearing might lead people to think, you know, even though you're a chaplain there for everyone's spiritual needs and you work in a very ecumenical way, but some people may reject what you have to say, imagining that it's only coming from a Buddhist perspective. Exactly, yes. Or if they have a very strong faith in another religion, then it doesn't fit, I can't talk to you, or I don't want to talk to you. And so, uh, and as a chaplain in hospice, or even in the hospital, too, it's, it's more for the person, the whole person, and not just about faith or religion. So, um, so yeah, it, it could really be, be a barrier in its mm-hmm. way. I mean, occasionally it would be, uh, very comforting. Like, I'm, I'm surprised you're talking about the white coat because I, um, I immediately have a sense of, uh, respect, uh, and, um, no, just th- that, uh, even a sense of deference in a way of wanting to ask more questions about the uh, the, the physical illness and things like that of, of the patients I'm with. But uh, yeah, I, it's true. The, the robes and the outer appearance can definitely um, be a deterrent. And maybe we should talk about that a little bit because I often encountered um, patients in hospice, but sometimes even hospice staff and volunteers who didn't really understand the role of a chaplain and who really believed that the chaplain was just there to represent whatever faith they came from or had been educated in. And so maybe you could just describe for our listeners a little bit about about what the role of the chaplain is you've already you've already mentioned it in a way um and what kind of training you receive just so that people really understand what what it is that chaplains do oh thank you i think that's an excellent question and and a very um pivotal one because Yes, I think sometimes people have a, pers- a view of chaplaincy just uh, really siloed into something about faith and religion, and yet it's much it's much broader. It's about the the nature and the and the spirit and soul of the person. So uh, it's about family. You know, what brought you joy? Sometimes, you know, I, I recently met a patient, and and what excited him about life was gambling and golf. <laughs> and so um, sometimes when I speak to them, you know, it's like it's like. Uh, looking at finding their place of joy, what what inspired them to keep going year after year or day after day? And what can what can open your heart now when you're in a place where you can't go out, even in this time of COVID, where that particular patient said, I can't see my friends, I can't go play cards, I can't um, get out on the golf cart course anymore. And so, no, it, it can be depressing because that what brought them that kind of inspiration and life before is lost. And so, um, no, I... This is where I often get into life review or tell me about your favorite places to go golf or, you know, why did you, why, why is gambling so exciting for you? And, and so it's much more about, I would say, spirit rather than just uh, 
a kind of um, pedantic counseling. So, um, yeah, finding finding the heart in each person. Mm. Yeah. I love that. And so it just reinforces the idea that regardless of what people's beliefs are or their faith system or having no faith at all uh, and no, no beliefs in God, everyone still has a spiritual nature that needs attention at the end of life. And, and they can benefit from exploring that. And so so that's always a point I wanted to make is that the chaplain is helpful for everyone. I know our nurses would come back and say, oh, well, no, this person told me they're an atheist, so they don't need the chaplain. And um, I would say, but, but the chaplain doesn't need to even talk to them about religion or God. The chaplain will just talk to them about, about deeper meaning in their own life. Thank you. Exactly. It's, it's so true. And um, oftentimes, you know, I think people have a, a preconception, even just hearing the name, the word chaplain, and it's an immediate no. And so uh, it's really about re, uh, just helping expand that awareness that it's not just about religion and and reading prayers or blessings yeah so maybe we need another term for the, the chaplain just some people are saying we need another word for hospice also because many people in our society now recoil against the word hospice and have a naked you know or a fearful connotation about hospice so maybe <laughs> maybe someday down the road we'll come up with a new name hospice chaplain we'll will have some other some other sort of title (laughs) yes yes yeah sometimes they say like a a spiritual counselor spiritual care counselor something like that but yeah you're absolutely right and and it's also getting the word out from from the many uh clients that we've had over the years the families that have found benefit and uh, ability to really work with their own um, family members on hospice better because it, it opens up um, other pathways for them to connect. And one of the ways, you know, is uh, I use reflection a lot and engaging the families together, opening up conversation. And, and uh, I think that we are as a society becoming more and more open, it's lovely, you know, that more people do some kind of meditative reflection or um, some even journaling, things like this to, to just really uh, bridge those places of um, grief and working with changed uh, physical and mental capacity, and being able to love our loved ones through end of life, and and for the patients themselves to be able to um, be able to share from their heart what is going on through their own stages, rather than don't talk about it, don't mention the H hospice word or the C the cancer word, but be able to just speak honestly to their tender heart and the challenges, the, the loss, the grief, the, the love and the appreciation of family that works so hard when the, the family member is at home. The, um, yeah, so, right, the, the emotional hurdles we experience both as patients and as family caregivers um, through this period. Mm. It's overwhelming, actually. But, uh, you know, to be able to soften that. that yes. Def- mm-hmm. Yes. And, and you write so beautifully. Well, for one thing, about, about reflections that you include in your book, The Three Regrets, 
inspirational stories of love and forgiveness at life's end. And I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the three regrets. The first one being, um, I did not live my life dreams. And so I was curious about when you're working with a patient who, who has that regret and feels, oh no, it's, it's too late. I didn't, I didn't follow my dreams. How, how do you find a way to help them with that regret? A lot of times it's with helping them, again, going back to what was that place that inspired them through their lives. And a lot of it is family or their careers or their other activities like uh, hiking, like going places, travel. And so when we touch into those places, then um, uh, oftentimes it's looking at how, oh my gosh, I did do those things. I did accomplish that. Rather than this, this kind of acquisitive um, mentality that we some, sometimes have of the next goal, the next thing, but to be a little more reflective, looking back and say, oh my gosh, I did make it through Yosemite hiking, or I did get to, uh, I, I just see this, my grandchildren around me who love me, or my, um, my daughter is so loving. Um, so to look at what's there and to, to appreciate what's there, appreciate what they've accomplished, rather than this sense of, oh, I could have done more. Because there is that part of accepting the fact that my health won't allow me to uh, climb another mountain. Oh, I love that idea. And even the fact that many times we may not even recognize the significance of the things we have done in our lives. Um, we're, we have a vision in our minds of something greater or more glorious we wish we could accomplish, but we may not even give ourselves credit for, for what we've already done, what we actually have accomplished. Yes, yes. I, I find that in myself as well, you know, <laughs> can do it a little better and keep going. But um, yeah, and so it's, it's all part of the, the dynamic also of accepting end of life. And that's one of the things that I'm hoping this book will help to unlock in people is that place of acceptance and um, uh, appreciation of, oh, okay, if, if, this is, if this is time, it's my, it's my situation is terminal to come to a place of contentedness and uh, acceptance. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's another, it's another uh, challenge for facing end of life. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I mean, I don't know if you um, have a sense of this, but I'm just curious to know if people who have come to terms with their mortality earlier in life, because I imagine that this would be true, are more likely to have earlier in life thought about what are my dreams and what do I want to accomplish and perhaps to have, have worked on those dreams earlier in their lives. But have, did you see that at all in your work with patients? Yeah, I, I, and, uh, and my readings too, and my, the stories I hear about, I think that a lot of people who have had early experiences or close experiences can really transform that and, and use it as a strong impetus to accomplish and go for their dreams and do really wonderful things and just love their life because they have that 
extra time that they may have had close calls, that they may have lost a loved one that just helped them turn around their own life experience and goal and say, I better go for it and do what I need to do. I have a friend now who's uh, been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and she was given six months to live. And that was a couple months ago. I hope to go visit her soon. But uh, she said they, they offered to do surgery, but I said, I'm 89. I, I've lived a really good life. I, I, I don't think I need to go through surgery to, to gain uh, maybe a few more months. Mm-hmm. And, I just love her, her um, courage, her dignity, and her dis- strong decision to just let me let me use the time I have to enjoy my family rather than go through um, invasive surgery now. Mm. I adm- oh, so admire that too because I think it does take courage to say I-, I will keep going on this path that I'm on and and not not reach out for more treatment, but just keep, keep looking ahead from where I am right now. Yeah. And you know what she did, has done, though, is she found a really good acupuncturist. And this is where what's beautiful about hospice is that, you know, we're much more open-minded or flexible in, within this medical system of hospice to uh, incorporate alternative um, therapies and so um I, I i love that flexibility so she's my friend's been um seeing an acupuncturist which gives her more strength and energy and her voice sounds stronger on the phone and i thought good on her you know to just be uh, as well as she can through this this these months that she has however mm-hmm. long it is and you know, speaking of uh, six months or less, it's it's um, it's such an approximate. We have a woman who was diagnosed with um, with cancer and six months to live, and she's still on our service three and a half years later. I've seen that happen as well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, evidence that our our skills of prognostication are not the best in medicine. (laughs) (laughs) He was saying, I gave away my clothes. I gave away my things. I'm still here. It's like, (laughs) the doctor told me six months. (laughs) I know. I always wonder, I, you know, I've always wondered like, should we give people a time frame at the end of life? But I could see I could see for some could view it as just this is a death sentence, but others could view it as an incentive. Well, if I only have six months, I'm going to start living fully right now. And I suppose it could work either way. Some people might live longer once they start really enjoying life, believing it it will end soon. So, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I think it it definitely could go either way. And uh, yes, it, but it's, it's such a wake up call to, to have something like that. It's true. And, and in reality, none of us knows how much time we have to live since, you know, anything can happen really, in, you know, in our lives. And so, so in some ways, I guess we, we could tell everyone I guess that's the message of impermanence. We don't know how long we'll be here, so we should really view every moment of life as moving us closer toward the end, and so make the most of each moment that you have. I think that it would also inform our conduct with others more. And uh, I had, case in point, I had a patient who on hospice, and he had a beautiful daughter, older, um, she had children, but the patient was saying when she was young, before preteen, 
that he and his wife had uh, divorced and he went to pick up his daughter and she was so angry and grieved by their divorce and as he as she was leaving with her dad she was yelling at her mother i hate you i i hope you die tonight and just horribly the woman the the mother was living up in the mountains and there was a huge flowering of something that caused uh, tremendous allergies and they couldn't get her down the mountain fast enough and she did die. Oh my goodness. Oh. And that little girl grew up with those final words to her mom oh. all in the back of her mind. And, you know, to, to realize in our own upset, anger, grief, loss, you know, sometimes we say and do things so, um, so hurtful to others and ourselves. But, you know, to, to realize not only am I uh, uncertain how long I have, but it's uncertain how people around us have also. Mm. So true. So true. We should not take anything for granted. And, and that actually leads into the second regret in your book, which is I did not share my love, which I heard that many, many times from patients as well, who um, suddenly woke up, I think, to the importance of love at the end of life and then were just in dismay in some ways at, at all the times that they had neglected to either to say I love you or share love with other people. So talk, talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think that there is this sense of, of loss and regret and that they, they could have spent a little more time, attention, um, presence, a real presence rather than distracted, distracted uh, togetherness <laughs> to be able to really love and appreciate the people around them. And uh, however, you know, we are extremely busy in our lives and it's realizing too that when we have you no... Know, when we realize we've got a limited amount of time, yeah, it let's use that so that we can be more present and loving and with the persons who mean a lot to us and and to to use that, that time well because it's always passing that time we have with each other. You know, maybe we only have uh the afternoon or the uh, the day and then it's gone now sometimes I get really worried when I go on a trip and I'm with with someone for a period of time whether it's my sister or going to visit some girlfriends something like that I just uh oh what are we gonna do all this time but then to relax and just enjoy and be present with them and to enjoy the, the beauty and the, the uh, amazing personality of who you're with. And uh, it can often surprise you. And, but then, you know, this, this sense of regret that comes up at, at, at end of life, I was thinking how, you know, that's a, actually a good sign to have this sense of regret because it's meaning you're paying attention now you're realizing and acknowledging even just within yourself that you no know, maybe there are some shortcomings in my in my love my attention my care for my family for my loved ones and that the regret is like telling you oh okay let me correct it now 
to, to be present now with the time I have left, to love them now and to, to apologize, to share my appreciation and gratitude to them now. So I think sometimes, uh, oftentimes that regret actually is a good sign. Mm, and that's part of the blessing of, I think, of being a patient who's dying in hospice versus a patient who might die suddenly, um, you know, without any advance warning that it's coming. There is, a, there is a blessing in having that gift of some time to be able to, to experience the regrets, as you're saying, that can be a good sign of opening and then uh, being having a, an opportunity at least to perhaps correct some of it and, and go back and change things. Yeah, and to, to appreciate people hanging in there with us, even not when we were obnoxious and distracted. <laughs> Yeah, do you have any any practices you recommend or reflections you recommend to help people who do have regrets to, to help them maybe open up and show more love? Mm. Well, the, uh, I, uh, in the book, I share the loving kindness uh, reflection. And um, uh, oftentimes we have to remember and really express that love in our own heart because we can often be the harshest on ourselves as well. And so to be able to um, to do that reflection, and, and sometimes I'll gather the family around together and uh, to, to say the, the loving kindness reflection, may I be filled with love. And I really integrate that with, with having them use their breath. And so to imagine love flooding through them, washing away this sense of pain and regret and, and lost time. And um, so may I be filled with love. May I be well and even as, as physically well as I can, given the circumstances, may my pain be relieved. Uh, may it be mentally and emotionally well. May I be peaceful and at ease so that my heart is filled more with contentment rather than grief at lost circumstances and lost time. And may I, it, it, even despite these circumstances, even though life is filled with ups and downs, may I be happy. And then, and then I have it shift to uh, have them send it to others around them, their family members, perhaps one person who's there, perhaps the entire family, or sometimes somebody who's really on their mind. Um, you know, with COVID, sometimes we're really separated from others. And so I say to imagine being with that, that person, or even if they've passed on, imagine being with your, your wife or husband or loved one. You know, imagine just sitting with them knee to knee and then send them your love. And I go through that exercise again. And, and oftentimes, you know, I will um, um, integrate that with their faith for them. For a Christian or Catholic, I'll have them imagine um, that, that um, Jesus Christ understands what you're going through, accepts you just as you are. And imagine that his eyes gaze at you with love and uh, really uh, um, understanding what you're going through. And then to just breathe in all the blessings from our Holy Father and just letting that, that love and blessings just wash away the grief, the unfinished business, the sadness, and to just, and then as they exhale, to just release any uh, upset and loss 
So I, I, I f- am very flexible with the reflections and meditation to uh, assist the patient and families and kind of depending on what I'm, uh, who I'm with and uh, um, using my intuition a little bit as to what might help them. So I think, you know, these reflections can be really, really potent because when you, and when you're working with breath as well, it, it helps integrate it into their body and into the, the muscle structure and help them relax. Mm. And it's, it's beautiful. And I, I love the fact that it's really very simple. I mean, the words are simple because I think that's important for someone at the end of life. It, it's not something over their heads or difficult to grasp that they you know, would have to study for a long time. It's simple when we talk to them about love and filling their heart with love. Not may, may not always be easy to do, but it's a, it's a simple concept. And so I, I, I think there's just perfection in that. It's beautiful. Uh, yes, thank you. And which is why I wrote the book also very simply. And it's an easy read because I, I felt like, uh, you know, to get into the philosophical or psychological or medical <laughs> concerns here is, is, uh, is not my expertise for one, but it's much more about the gentle heart. And so, yeah, I like the, the reflections to be simple as well. And then um, the third regret, I hate, well, I don't want to give away too much about the book, but, but maybe we could just touch on it. The third regret is I did not forgive, which in my mind always kind of comes together with love because those we love, we ha- have to learn how to forgive at some point or another. And, and so that, Forgiveness really takes us even deeper into our love for other people, yet it's so common for most of us to really struggle with the idea of forgiveness. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking about how we were speaking earlier about uh, what we wear can be a wall to others, but even mentally, you know, when we're hanging on to uh, stuff that we need to clean up with others, that can be a wall too, emotionally and energetically with how we relate to others because it's something we didn't clean up. And so, no, we're always, uh, um, it's like that unfinished business and I don't even know how to bring it up or um, maybe they forgot about it, but I'm still carrying around this load of, of uh, regret of not having ever, ever cleaned up this uh, sense of um, not forgiving or um, not forgiving myself for something really um really detrimental to my relationships and to my family Mm. and so there's that part of uh um forgiveness you know or not forgiving can be like extra baggage and you know one of my teachers would always say you know you want you want your life and your heart to be clean clear I always say clean, clear. <laughs> uh-huh. that, it's so it's so meaningful, you know, to to just clear up the that regret, so that our hearts can be clean, clear, and uh, that that we can rest easy as we transition and as a. Uh, as a uh, social worker friend of mine said when I came into hospice, you know, the people in, in, at end of life are transitioning from the physical realm into the spiritual realm, you know, and so that we can, we can make that journey clean, clear. <laughs> hmm. I love that, clean, clear. And... Uh... And I'm so happy that you included this regret about forgiveness in your book because it's something we really 
don't necessarily learn how to do earlier in lives in our lives, unfortunately. And many of us end up having to look at forgiveness, perhaps for the first time at the very end of life. And it's so necessary that we have more teaching and reflections on forgiveness so we can all start to start to learn about it and start working toward being clean, clear, (laughs) I guess, even (laughs) earlier in life. Yeah, it keeps us from being present, too, when we're hanging on to these, you know. So, yeah, to be able to just um, let them go or to resolve them in some way, at least to make the effort. Um, so it's, it, yeah, it's, it was a good one. Mm-hmm. Well, oh gosh, I'm so enjoying talking to you, Tenzin, about your book, The Three Regrets. And I, there's one last thing before we go that I just wanted to ask you about, because I feel like this is a really important perspective. You wrote in your book um, at the end uh, some things about medically assisted dying. And I, I think um, I, it's, it's such an important conversation we're all having right now. And I was wondering if you'd share with the audience what you wrote in your book about the, the Dalai Lama's position on medically assisted dying. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's been a really big question for me because it's uh, really taking medication, barbiturates, to shorten our life and to pass away quickly. So um, I was really concerned about that because in my training as a, a monastic, as in the uh, even as my practice as uh, a Buddhist, you know, we have that view that the, the, our, our, first, our first precept is not to kill. And so um, I, uh, in my work in hospice, I find that, you know, the question comes up a lot when I have a lingering terminal illness. The quality of my life is gone. I don't want to keep perpetuating this. And can I, can I take the, uh, uh, the medication to die, die now, you know, to die sooner? And um, I... I was very concerned about it because we do have patients here in California, people can do this. And, um, but uh, I was concerned about my involvement and I see people really, really struggling with just the pain issues, not even considering the medically assisted dying that, you know, how would I like, how would I fare with it when I only know it's downhill? <laughs> and so it's a, it's a very, very serious and important question. So um, I've checked with one of my um, teachers, and I, I've been researching this situation with the Dalai Lama. I did ask him about it uh, in one of our group interviews. And you know, um, there there is this situation of understanding that our life is really precious, and if we can if we can continue, you know, with greater mental clarity through our life, and medication can help ease the pain, then that is something good. But you know when uh, if the uh, if the strong medications cause us to be um, really to blight out our conscious awareness, then then that is more difficult also with this and uh, understanding what we're going through. Well, one of my teachers said on this that, you know, the, the intention is not to, it's, it's not to harm, but it's more in the 
understanding that I'm already terminally ill. I'm already heading towards demise. But this long extended dying is um, extremely difficult and painful. Um, then, you know, it's, he said, the focus is more on the sense of compassion for the condition because medications can keep us alive a lot longer today. And uh, so um, I, I would have to say the Dalai Lama's position exactly, I don't know, but, you know, he, he is saying that um, he understands that th this opportunity is available to us now. And that, you know, the, uh, how we die is really important. Within the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and you know, as you've read the Tibetan book of living and dying, you know that, that it is a, a very key point in our practice also to try to be as conscious as possible through the dying state. Um, and, um, you know, if we can, if we can um, do this with an an awareness as we're dying. And now I have to say that it's mainly for practitioners or uh, pra yoga practitioners who are really trying to understand the um, nature of consciousness also as, as you, um, as we go into our demise. So um, I'm sorry, it's kind of a long-winded answer, and I'm still trying to form the, the answers and understanding myself, but um, it's, uh, I think it's an ongoing question, I have to say, an ongoing um, situation we have to examine. And, and in my book, I did explain that, you know, that the Dalai Lama is saying, you know, what is, what is the, the uh, uh, nature of my mind at the time of dying? He said, you know, if I can go peacefully that, that, and with awareness, that's great. But if I were to die, say, in a plane crash, I don't know what my mental state would be like then. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, yeah, to... To, to try to really um, examine in our in our own minds, you know, what is the best for ourselves. And I and I would say that though um, more patients, of, and it's a still a small fraction, may um, apply and and have the um, the drugs for the medically assisted dying that many of them don't take it in the end. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, wanting a, a sense, perhaps just wanting that option, that option, that sense of control, even at the end of life. Mm -hmm. Well, I like that I mean, there isn't um, one answer for everyone. And also that compassion is really key in the whole discussion and, having compassion for anyone in that situation who might be trying to make that decision or that choice for themselves. I, I think that that feels right to me that we, that we view it all with compassion and hope the person can find the way to the, the least harm for them in, in whatever choice they make. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I, I, I really feel that too. Well, um, just for the audience, I've been talking with Tenzin Kiyosaki about her book, The Three Regrets, Inspirational Stories of Love and Forgiveness at Life's End, which will be coming out in early 2021. Is that that's correct? Yeah. I believe? Yes, we're looking at March 9th now. <laughs> okay, March 9th, 2021. And you'll be able to learn more about it at her website, TenzinKiyosaki.com. Again, there will be links in the show notes for, for the website so you can find your way there. And um, having read the book, I highly recommend it. It's, it's beautiful. And Tenzin, it's been, once again, it's been absolutely delightful to have a conversation with you. 
Oh, thank you so much. And I really appreciate your time and uh, being, being together with you. Well, many blessings to you as you go forward in your work. Thank you, and for you as well. Right. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Tenzin Kiyosaki as much as I enjoyed it. I listened to the replay of it and found myself back in that state of just total relaxation and comfort as I as I listen to Tenzin's words. So I'm hoping it had a similar effect for you to listen to our conversation together. I loved when Tenzin talked about listening through the heart. And that really resonates with me. And actually, because I do a lot of work with the heart, in fact, in meditation and deep breathing, focusing on the heart, holding my hand over my heart. And so it's one more step, a fairly simple step to think of actually listening through my heart, having my heart so open that I can listen and hear what others need to say. And I just wanted to add that on to what I talked about before I played the interview, the idea of being able to share love wherever we go with people we're not even speaking to, people we don't know, just people that we encounter randomly in our lives. And I like to add to that this idea of of listening through the heart and opening the heart to be so big that it can hold all of, of whatever another person is feeling, if they're walking around with anxiety or stress or anger or hatred, our hearts are so spacious and so filled with love that we can absorb all of that negativity and not be affected by it, not have it change us at all, but simply help alleviate some of the burden of that pain for the people that we encounter. And so listening through the heart with quotes around listening, because as I said, maybe it's someone we're not even speaking to, but in a way our hearts are open and are, are listening to that person's energy and helping to diffuse it a little bit and to lessen the pain that they're feeling. So if you enjoyed this interview and the other content that I share on this podcast, I hope that you'll tell other people about it. You can share episodes with them if you think someone would benefit from listening to a specific episode. Also, if you haven't subscribed yet, go to one of the podcast providers wherever you happen to listen. If it's on your phone, it might be Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher Radio. I'm on all of those platforms. So wherever you choose to listen to podcasts, subscribe and then leave a review because that really helps others to find the podcast who might be looking for content like this. Thanks to all of you who have left reviews in the past. I really appreciate it. And you can also support this podcast by becoming a patron on my page at patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash e-o-l-u and join the team there of people who are making just a small contribution once a month to keep the podcast on the air and you'll receive some extra bonuses when you're part of our Patreon team. And thank you so much to everyone who's been contributing for the last four and a half years or so for the podcast. I really appreciate you. It means everything to me. So tune in next week. I'll be back with another interview for you. Sign up for the laughter yoga webinar if you're interested in that. And until we're together again, remember, we're here for love. So face your fear, be ready for whatever happens next, and love each and every moment of your precious life. Bye-bye.